It is really, really a great pleasure welcoming all of you to our ACG American Council on Germany and Espen Germany um, event in our state-to-state -state German American State Legislator Dialogue. It's not the first time we meet, quite the contrary. We have been meeting in this format for quite a while, but today we are meet, we are going to discuss a topic which is of very great importance to all of us because it's so important for our both of our societies addressing educator shortages and pandemic related learning loss um, and we have a wonderful wonderful um, group of panelists who I am not going to introduce but who are going to be introduced by Steve Soko um, who I'm going to hand over just in a second with our state-to-state -state legislator um, dialogue, state legislator dialogue. Um, we um, intend to strengthen the transatlantic relationship um, on a different level than the relationship between Washington and Berlin or Washington and the European Union. And why we do Washington and Brussels. And why we do this is because we have learned through experience that nothing can replace the people-to-people -people relationship also on the sub-federal level. And it comes in as particularly important if things are not going so well on the national level. And that's why we decided both of our organizations um, to address um, different parts of the governance structure, including um, the state legislatures. And in the past, we have focused on different issues um, already um, uh, during the pandemic, um, how to deal with the pandemic, um, but we also uh, touched upon dual education, we touched about the health systems, we touched about the housing um, crisis and, and the rent crisis, so we covered many different issues. Um, but as I, as I mentioned before, today is an issue, today we are covering an issue which is particularly close to our heart, um, and I know um, that uh, ACG has done a lot on educational issues. And as, as always, it's a great pleasure, um, Steve, to cooperate with you and your team. Um, it's one of our uh, highlights. Um, and with this, I hand um, over to you. Thank you so much for, again, for the great cooperation to you and your team. And I'm looking forward to a wonderful discussion, which you're going to moderate. And I'm going to, to um, just jump in and ask my questions as a participant. <laughs> Well, Stormy, herzlichen Dank. Um, it is always great to partner with you and your colleagues at Aspen. And um, I can only say the same, that this is a highlight for us. We we really value the partnership on this state-to-state -state dialogue because we think that this series is so important in terms of creating a forum for legislators at the state level in Germany and the United States to talk with each other, to exchange ideas, um, often in a format that they do not have an opportunity to exchange in, in in other ways. And we have found, particularly over the last few years, that this kind of dialogue at the subnational level is extremely important and, and valuable. So thanks to you, Stormy. Thanks to Aspen Germany for, for partnering. Um, as everybody who's on this call today knows, uh, we want to talk about education today, and we want to focus specifically on K-12 to um, and education or, or the shortage of educators and teachers, but also on pandemic-related learning loss as we really put the pandemic into the rearview mirror. Um, I think it's fair to say that both in Germany and the United States, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the challenges that many were facing in the education field. Teacher shortages were already apparent before the pandemic, and they've become an overwhelming challenge for education systems. Extended school closure, hybrid learning arrangements, student disengagement from the classroom, and mental health challenges also contributed to a historic learning loss. And obviously these two challenges are closely interlinked and require action today, even though the school year is rapidly coming to an end. So we want to look at how state legislators in both countries are trying to support, train, and retain educators, and what solutions might exist to help mitigate learning loss so that all students have access to equitable, high-quality education. As always, with our state-to-state -state dialogue, we welcome questions from our audience, and so I'd like to invite you now 
to use the Q&A function in Zoom to pose a question, and I'll fold your question into the conversation. But you can also raise your hand virtually, and we can bring you into the conversation live in about 30 minutes if you want to ask your question in person. Just keep in mind that the event will be recorded and will be uploaded to our social media um, channels afterwards. So without any further ado, let me welcome our speakers. Um, the bios will be posted in the chat function so you can read up on all of them. On the German side, I'm delighted to welcome Jochen Ott. He's a member of the Social Democratic Party in the state parliament of North Rhine-Westphalia, and he was recently elected as chairman of the SPD parliamentary group. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. <laughs> We're also joined um, by Andreas Sturm, who's a member of the Christian Democratic Union in the state parliament of Baden-Württemberg. Herzlich willkommen to you. Thanks for having me here. And on the U.S. side, we're joined by three Democrats from very different states. We're joined by Senator Ramesh Akbari from Tennessee. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. We're joined by Representative Ed Delaney from Indiana. Thank you for being with us as well. And we're joined by Representative Steve Altrino from Massachusetts. We're happy to have you here. Thank you for having me today. So many, many thanks to all five of you for taking the time to talk with us today. And I thought that we could start with sort of a, a lightning round of less than a minute each. Um, I'd like each of you to, to share your connection to education or education policy and just give us sort of a common starting point. And I, I thought we could start with our German guests. Um, so Jochen Ott, I'd, I'd like to start with you. What's, what's your connection to education and education policy? Jochen Ott's screen seems to be frozen. Um, and I at least have lost Andreas Sturm. No, so, oh, no yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Andreas Schwarm. Sorry. Maybe I can substitute. <laughs> yes. Um, before I became a member of parliament, I worked as a teacher for eight years uh, with the subjects of English and religious education at secondary school and a vocational school. And in my last three years, I also worked at uh, the Ministry of Education at the Federal State of Hessen and at the Teachers Academy. And now I'm member of the Landtag of uh, the State Parliament of Baden-Württemberg, and there I'm in the Committee for uh, Education. So a deep background, both as a practitioner and, and also as a, as a lawmaker. Um, and while we, while we wait for, for Jochen Otz to, to rejoin us, let me uh, come over to this side of the Atlantic and, and start with Senator Akbari from Tennessee. Can you share with us your sort of connection to, to education? Well, you know, I'm I'm not an educator, but I have always felt that education really is part of the great equalizer. Of course, people need opportunity as well, uh, but I've seen the benefits of communities being lifted up by having strong public schools, uh, the pathways and the ways that the trajectory of, of people's lives are changed through education. And certainly as a lifelong learner, I, I knew that it was something that was important to my platform. When I ran for office, that was one of the number one complaints or concerns that I got from constituents. Their schools were closing in their communities. They felt like their, their children weren't getting the resources mm -hmm. they need. So it was very important to me to make it a big issue within, within my own um, career. <clears throat> Thank you for that. I think um, we will get into some of the issues that you're talking about in a in a broader context, right? The the word opportunity um, and concerns about how one sets a pathway for today's youth so that they can succeed tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Um, Ed Delaney from Indiana, how about you? You know, my connection is uh, only really in the legislature. I am a lawyer, longtime lawyer, and I'm on two committees only, and they are the two that relate to education. One is the Education Committee, which deals with education policy generally, and the other one is I'm on what's called Ways and Means, the Budget Committee. 50% of our state budget goes to uh, K-12 through education. 
So it's the single most important budget issue as well as being important on its own. I've been here 15 years in the legislature and I probably have 10 years on the budget committee and 10 years on the education committee. I'm very happy to combine those two. Uh, my teaching experience is limited to a couple of years as an adjunct professor at a law school, which is quite a different thing. And I, I certainly hope during the course of our conversation, we come back to the financial component um, and how to pay for some of the things to make sure that we're that we have a strong education system in place. Mm -hmm. um, and last but not least, from the U.S. side, uh, Representative Steve Altrino from Massachusetts. Uh, hello, how are you? I want to thank you again for having me on. So um I've been a teacher probably for the last 23 years now. I taught high school, uh, business and economics. Then I was a principal of an elementary school, which was preschool to the middle school, uh, sixth grade. And then I took a different turn and I spent a lot, seven years as a director in correctional education. So I oversaw education in, in uh, many of our correctional facilities. And... Um, so I, uh, I currently teach uh, at two as an adjunct, as uh, Rep Delaney uh, mentioned. One, I teach public policy, but the other I teach uh, in our teacher prep program at our state university to prepare uh, young folks to uh, hopefully enter uh, some sort of education field when they graduate. Um, I've been the vice chair of the uh, Committee on Education for the last three years. Uh, like Ed, I've been on Ways and Means uh, for the last six years. Education, um, besides health care, is uh, our second largest budget. And a few years ago, we passed a multi-billion dollar Student Opportunity Act, which will add billions of dollars over the next five years uh, uh, from pre-K, early childhood, to public college. So I... Uh, I've been an educator, it's, it's my passion, and I'm honored to be here today. Well, we're delighted to have you again as a, as a practitioner and now as a policymaker. I think bridging those two worlds is gonna be very valuable for the exchange today. Um, and now it looks like Jochen Ott is, is back with us. Um, uh, we are still talking about sort of the, the general introduction. What's your connection to, to education and education policy? Yeah, uh, hello. Um... I'm sorry, but suddenly it was a breakdown. I don't know. Yes, I was a teacher before I went a full-time politician. Uh, I worked as a teacher nearby Cologne uh, for history, social studies, and re religious studies. And um, several years, I was the chairman of the Social Democratic Party of Cologne. And since 2010, I'm a member of parliament of Notre Dame Westphalia. Since uh, 2017, I'm uh, focusing on education policy as a member of the education committee. Uh, as deputy chairman in the last years um, uh, of the parliamentary group of social democrats, until last week, I was uh, um, in charge for all the questions of uh, politi political initiatives concerning equal opportunities in the area of education. So early childcare, school, university, lifelong learning, uh, as well as child welfare. And now um, I was elected last week uh, as the new chairman of the Social Democrats in the parliament uh, uh, in North Rhine Westphalia. And so I'm, I tried to take uh, yeah, the uh, education policy as, as a pri priority with me, if you uh, like that. And um, I think uh, it's quite interesting uh, that uh, a long time in Germany we thought we are quite good in education policy, but nowadays we, we can see in many newspapers, in, in many um, uh, discussions uh, called uh, Bildungskatastrophe, yeah, uh, that, that we have uh, a lot of uh, problems and we try to, to solve them, and I, I hope it, it's, it, it works at the end. I'm very... Well. Um, interested in the discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for setting the stage with us. And I'd like to, to stay with you, Jochen Ott, for, for a couple more minutes because you, you provided a great segue to my next question by saying that in the press, one's reading about an education catastrophe. 
in Germany that there are big concerns about education. And as we continue to set the stage for our conversation, I'd like to hear from each of you what the, the two or three top education challenges are in your state. And so um, Jochen Ott, maybe, maybe you, can, you can start us off since, since you provided that nice bridge for us. Um, yes, uh, I can do. I think one problem is that we uh, too little money spent on education uh, in Germany uh, belong of the OECD uh, average amount. And uh, the, the main problem, in my opinion, is uh, that it's a dysfunctional financial system because we have on the other, on the one hand, we have the, the interdependences between the Federal Republic of Germany, as their Bund, that we say, and on the other side, the federal states and then the local authorities. And uh, we have organization problems, who pays what and how, how fits it all together. Um, I think this is a big problem, but because if there's no one responsible, that it cannot work really. And so we have uh, uh, organization problems. Uh, besides that, we have organization problems between uh, um, the, the um, different uh, parts of so education, youth, universities. They have all their own ministers. And uh, often, the, the, in, I don't know in English that the word, but it's, it's the ressort, yeah, the, the different ressort. The department. Departments didn't fit really good together. And this is uh, so the big organization problem. And the second is uh, the problem that uh, today uh, the school system has to be reformed because due to the uh, teacher shortages, the pandemic situation, uh, the uh, IE as uh, uh, digital and, uh, uh, and all uh, the, the question of globalization, uh, we cannot really prepare children um, so as it has to be. Uh, the question is, um, uh, in the end, a huge, a huge number of students in Germany leave school without a functional uh, uh, um, preparation for job. And we have about uh, a very high rate of, uh, of functional illiterates. Uh, and so we have a real problem uh, at uh, the bottom of the of the education system, and we have a problem on the top rate of the um, of the of the system, and uh, so I think we have to organize uh, for for a new time. We have to organize a new education system, uh, perhaps with more creativity, um, to uh, yeah get the best out of the children, and I suppose that the meritocratic system the last years is not really um, uh, well done in Germany for, 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 for um, yeah, the necessary changement. Thank you. Um, Andreas Sturm, um, some of the things that Jochen Ott was describing um, undoubtedly are true in, in your state, in, in Baden-Württemberg as well. Um, how would you describe the top two or three challenge, education challenges that you're facing? Yes, I would like to identify uh, two challenges. One is the shortage of teachers, but also uh, the lack of skilled labor force in pedagogic jobs uh, in, yes, in general. And the second is the lack of basic knowledge in reading, writing and maths in elementary school. Um, a quarter of our students doesn't meet, uh, don't meet the minimum requirements and I think uh, that is alarming. But I don't always think that it's a money problem. I think we have to spend our money more effectively because we have uh, 60 different countries and we don't have the problems everywhere. So this means uh, traditionally some countries are better than the others. And this is not about the students uh, in these countries. It's about political decisions, I, I think. So just a, a point of, of clarification, you're talking about the 16 Länder, right? Yes, um, the, the so state, the, sorry, the, the state. state. No, no, it's, 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 it's okay. I just want to make sure that that the the Americans um, also understand that we're talking about the, the states, that there are differences between each of the German states um, and that, you know, obviously that, that, that it's a little different from state to state. Some states are more successful 
than than others. And we will undoubtedly get into that a little bit as well. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing some things from our, our friends in Germany that will probably resonate with everybody here in the US because some of the challenges are, are very, very similar that we're hearing described. Um, Senator Akbari, you know, what are the, the top two or three education challenges that you're dealing with in, in Tennessee? Well, I'll tell you, um, I serve as the vice chair of the education committee. In the past couple of years, our conversation has been dominated by non-issues, um, social issues re related to the LGBTQ community, sports, um, things that, that really do not move our students forward. Um, I'll say the top two issues that are, I won't say being ignored, but really aren't getting are not there's not good policy i think to move things forward literacy is a big one um across the state that's something that has not improved uh even if we've had gains in science and math we have not had gains in literacy uh we passed a law a few years ago that will keep a child back will retain that child if they do not perform proficient on our standardized tests that does not actually test literacy. It's English language arts. For me, it's more of a grammar test. It just went into effect this year. 60% of third graders will have to take a summer camp. Otherwise, they will be retained and will have to repeat third grade. Very controversial. Uh, parents are really struggling with this legislation. I don't think it was ready. My colleagues did not want to um, delay it by a year. Uh, so, so that's something that's big that we're struggling with. Um, another thing has to do with really teacher pay and morale. Um, so our governor announced that he wanted to get the starting salary for teachers to $50,000 a year, but it's going to be a three-year process. And he tied it to um, stopping payroll deductions for teacher unions. So now they can't, um, <clears throat> which that, le that legislation had failed multiple years in a row. So I actually voted against giving teachers a raise because it was, it was ridiculous and they didn't need legislation to do it. It could have been a budget um, line item and they could have given the teachers $50,000 right away. Tennessee borders eight other states and Mississippi and Arkansas. <laughs> have a higher salary than we do. Uh, so I think improving teacher morale and pay is really important. And I should note, our state has had a surplus for 10 years. So it's not that we can't do it. It's not the ability to do it. It's the will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think you're raising a couple of, of key issues here. Um, teacher pay has been notoriously low in, in both countries um, and in, in many states. And that's part of what it makes what makes it very difficult to to find good qualified teachers. Um, Ed Delaney, what's what's the situation like in Indiana? Well, it's kind of different here. We are a leading state in the so-called choice movement uh, for what is called education reform, um, but we do have the standard problems you've mentioned. Uh, even before COVID, we were losing uh, students at our uh, teacher education programs at a very rapid rate approximately one as of even six or eight years ago one out of three teachers never entered their second year of teaching they so we put them through the program that is now shrinking and they came out of the program and lasted one year so we have a big problem we have begun to address the pay thing i think the majority has conceded that that's an issue we're moving pay upwards uh, it's hard because we have in this state 270 separate school systems with their own elected boards uh, we have uh, voucher schools, which means basically largely religious schools that now receive state funding. They never did that before 2010. Uh, and then we have a movement called charter schools, so uh, which is independent sponsored schools uh, with limited regulation. So our system is incredibly complex. I, I would like to introduce a term here that I've come to favor. We have what, and I hope you don't have this in Germany, what, what I call the education industrial complex. So in addition to our voters, our teachers unions, our politicians, we have foundations, endowments, not-for-profits that push various ideas of education reform, put millions of dollars into school board elections, uh, come to the legislature with highly paid lobbyists to quote, reform us all the time. So and while we're having those standard struggles about, you know, uh, the COVID loss and, and the, the number of teachers, we have this whole sideshow uh, that's in addition to the sideshow about who goes to which bathroom 
and what kids are allowed to see which books that we're having. So we're not focused is be my number one point. We are not focused on can the kids read can the kids do math. Um, and we lost some things. We, we got away from traditional methods of teaching reading. We're trying to move back on that. So I see some progress, especially for English language learners, for our immigrant population, we're paying much more attention, paying more attention to our special ed, the kids with disabilities. But for the average kid who doesn't have those particular problems, we're not doing well, especially in the poorer areas. So uh, it's a very difficult moment and we're struggling. So from, from your struggle, um, I, I saw Steve Altrino sort of shaking his head and nodding his head as, as you were speaking. Um, what's, what's the situation like in Massachusetts? Well, you know, fortunately, um, education has always been on the forefront in Massachusetts. We're, you know, fortunate enough on the national, you know, standardized test, if that's one measure of ranking, you know, one of the top in the country, um, but we have our issues as well. Fortunately, our legislature is about 84% Democratic now, uh, as well as now the governor and all, all four constitutional offices. So we money, as uh, my colleague here in Germany says, you know, we're putting more money into education, but how are we spending it? And um, like uh, Ed Delaney said, we have over 300 local school boards and regional boards. Uh, so they have a lot of local control. Um, it'd be nice to get a little more support from the federal government, which we get very little, uh, except for like Title I funding. Um, but social emotional well being of a student is something we're focusing more on. We, you know, we're hiring more behavior specialists, we're hiring more folks to help with family integration, visiting visiting uh, people's homes, seeing how we can improve the external factors like poverty, um, addiction, um, hunger, whatever is hurting students from actually, we now passed a bill, we cover all school meals for K-12 um, in the state budget. We're, uh, we just passed a mental health bill to add more resources to the schools. The problem is, like all of you, we have the money, we don't have the personnel. Um, and this federal opera funds will be expiring soon. Uh, we have about 10,000 openings right now across the Commonwealth. That does not include Catholic, parochial, private, or charter schools. Um, uh, teacher prep programs, as Ed mentioned, I teach in them. Uh, we've seen um, either more going into, say, early childhood or maybe community ed, uh, but middle school and high school, it's very difficult to find those specialists to teach the math and, and the sciences, etc. Fortunately, we don't waste our time on which books are going to be banned. We protect all students, LGBTQ+. Plus, um, the other, the worst problem, and I'll, I'll close with this, is we still have an achievement gap in Massachusetts. We welcome many new immigrants, refugees. Um, many are in my district, which is a lower income district. We're still, they're very transient. So um, we're trying to overcome whether it's the uh, language access, whether it's the cultural ac access or the mental well-being of the student, you know, coming from a country where there's so much uh, danger, there's so much poverty, how do we integrate them and get them to achieve? Um, that, and you see that, you don't see that in the wealthier white districts, but you do see that in more of our urban districts. And, and that's a struggle that we'll, we have been working on in Frankly, that's not going away. Massachusetts has been welcoming more and more refugees. Um, and finally, the cost of living in Massachusetts is one of the highest in the countries. So mm -hmm. to keep up with wages and stuff um, is a struggle. It, it, yeah. it really is a struggle. So it's it's really interesting to hear all of you talk because um, I think there's some some very interesting overlaps in terms of some of the challenges that you're facing. I mean, obviously, 
there's the overarching shortage of of qualified teachers and and sort of the the challenge of retra- retaining those teachers once one has them and once one's trained them. Um, but it's interesting to hear all of you also talk about the achievement gap and sort of the the lack of basic skills and knowledge that some students have as they progress from elementary school to middle school to high school and then beyond high school. Um, and so it's 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 a big challenge. And I guess one thing that that none of you have have really commented on is how these two issues have been exacerbated by the pandemic. I mean, these were issues before the pandemic. I have a sense that they are much worse now. Um, is that is that true? I mean, some of you are, are nodding your heads. Um, and Delaney, why don't why don't you go ahead yeah, first? Yeah. As an example, we have a significant, maybe a three or four month decline in our wealthier school district students tested for math and English language, okay? So they lost two or three months. The kids in the more difficult areas, the poorer kids, frankly, have lost five or six or eight months. So yes, and we've lost students. Thousands of students have simply disappeared, mainly at the high school level. They just never came back. So yeah, that, that the impact of COVID has been very, very harsh. And one of the problems is maybe it's a good thing, but we don't have a lot of experience in an emergency program to catch students up. So we've thrown together some programs, mainly with money from Washington, to uh, try to get kids back to where they should be, either during the summer or during the school year. But that's, in my mind, has proven to be an opportunity for education entrepreneurs to make money. And so far, we don't know whether they're making money is improving these kids. So that is a that is a serious effect that fell on top of everything else. And it's going to take us some years to get out of it. Washington's money will run out, I think, essentially at the end of next year. But we, we have to fix this now. That's part of the problem. We're not used to instantaneous focuses uh, on particular groups of students, individual students, to bring them back. We, we don't have a history of doing that except during the normal school year in the normal classroom. So that is a struggle. And I hope we can find out how to do this better <laughs> and how to do it efficiently. Yeah. Steve Altrino, you're, you're nodding your head. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, you know, in Massachusetts, on average, we lost about three quarters of a grade level because of COVID. Um, we had about a 45% absenteeism. You know, we kept kids out of school longer than many states, uh, which was a bone of contention for a lot of folks. Um, but I, I think uh, besides test scores, which I'm not the biggest fan of those standardized tests and high stakes testing, you know, we're seeing some, especially our younger kids, like I had a a Venice six and seven years old for two years during COVID, they saw very little structure or social learning. So when they put them in kindergarten and grade one, I call my brother and he says, they don't know how to act. They don't know how to respond to other children or play with other children. And that's actually affecting the classroom, whether it's management, behavior, and then academics as a result. So like Ed says, we have all these companies, all these organizations getting millions of dollars to kind of fill in the gap. I think the jury's still out on whether that's working or not, uh, especially in our lower income uh, minority and uh, immigrant districts. So I definitely want to come back to to sort of the the learning loss, um, which we've seen in the last year and which, you know, seems to have affected kids all over, but where there also seems to be a, um, a, you know, not just a, there's a wealth, a wealth gap, right? There's a, there's an, there's the achievement gap, but then also the, the wealth gap, which gets into sort of some of the equity questions that we've started to talk about and lack of opportunity. And one of our viewers is curious whether Germany has the same challenges um, educating immigrants and, and people of color as we have in the United States. Do the same kinds of gaps exist in North Rhine-Westphalia and, and Baden-Württemberg? Yes, should I stop maybe? Sure, go ahead. Stop, that is okay. Uh, yes, we have, but when I was talking about not meeting the minimum requirements, this doesn't only... Uh, 
uh, is not only connected with immigrants. This is clear and this is also shocking for us because there are also some social classes in Germany uh, that still have problems, educate the people, maybe read books or um, yeah, read a fairy tale at the, uh, in the evening. Uh, but also we have the problem that, for example, my country, my, my state, Baden-Württemberg, we have more um, asylum seekers than the whole of France. And we have 11 million uh, inhabitants. So you see there is a high in, um, influx of people and we try to educate them in the same way as we educate our inhabitants. So we don't make a difference. Uh, for example, only let them play the whole day. So they are in kindergarten, they are in school. And I think that's really a tough challenge. Yeah, I, I try. Um, first of all, I, I want to say um, I, I can, um, many of the points uh, of uh, the American uh, colleagues, I can say yes. For example, industrial complex, with many money for um, lobbyism and every uh, other thing, I can uh, say uh, the good money from Berlin, not from Washington, to help uh, in the specific situation and the money is running out and there's nothing uh, behind. Um, the question of students disappear. Uh, this is really true. We, we are sitting here in the parliament and uh, the universities and uh, even the... Um, economies of um, uh, the Ausbilder um, uh, in the, um, uh, the Bo in der beruflichen Bildung, sorry. Yeah, the, <laughs> the trainers, the, basically the, the, the trainers that, that teach the teachers, right? Uh, yeah, for example, and uh, in der beruflichen Bildung, um, they all tell us um, that students and young pupils disappear. They don't know where they are after uh, the pandemic. And, and therefore, I just uh, want to say the pandemic has highlighted the problems we had before. And now we are on the point that we have to discuss how to, uh, to, to get the, the system, the educational system structural uh, in a new uh, dimension and bring all the money from the different departments together to form it. And um, therefore, there are more... Um, uh, or uh, several uh, new problems. For example, in, in Germany, a big uh, uh, problem is uh, a lot of Ukrainian, uh, young Ukrainian pupils uh, who need just room. And therefore we, we just um, brought uh, the, the school system from eight years to back to nine years in the gymnasium uh, back. That means one year more school and that means a lot of problems uh, in many local authorities having the room in schools mm -hmm. to teach the, the young people. And then there are a lot of uh, people coming um, from Ukraine, for example. But uh, we should say here um, that uh, uh, immigrants uh, from Northern Africa or um, uh, others uh, as well. And so all this... Uh, problems together uh, is a very huge pressure on the system. And uh, another problem is we are not very good in, I don't know if the word is right like that, but multilingualism, mm -hmm. because we have a, a lot of young people um, didn't, uh, didn't know how to speak uh, a mother language and German as well, uh, because they, uh, they never learned to speak the mother language correct. And if you don't speak your mother language correct and German as the new mother language uh, correct, then you cannot follow the school. So that we have to think about how to, to uh, um, uh, support young, um, young kids in speaking both languages uh, to um, get a better performance uh, in school. And the last point I want to, to, to make is the pandemic brought a lot of youngsters to mental health problems. I've never seen so many mental health problems like in the last years earlier on when I was young, uh, the, the pupils government, um, the trade union of pupils normally discussed about uh, um, peace 
and uh, climate change. And, and now a lot of schools, a lot of uh, representative or pupils always talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unbelievable. And I'm, I'm worrying how we can support our youngsters because we never can pay for the last, for the next 20, 30 years, all the therapy hours uh, in the health system. So we, we need time for schools, for the teachers to talk with them, to uh, have a, have a, yeah, to, to have a discussion about what, what's going on in the families. What yeah. is, uh, the reason for this development. So I, I definitely like to come back to this this mental health question, both on the side of the teachers and on the side of the students in, in just a moment. Um, Stormy has a question or a comment, but before I bring you in, Stormy, one of our viewers is, is curious whether it's easy to identify who or what is actually responsible for the learning loss. Is it the teachers? Is it new technologies? Is it the fact that elementary schools are not effectively teaching the basics, as Andrea Sturm was talking about, that very often students in elementary school are not getting the building blocks to build on for their, you know, progression through the education system. In each of your states, are there clear indicators of what sort of the core is for the learning loss or is it too difficult to identify a single or a handful of issues because it's it's there's too much going on right i think we could oh, oh sorry no no go go ahead andreas and then sorry. i think ed you were next and very shortly, I think we could identify uh, some some reasons. One is, as I already said, family background. Uh, it was usual to read books at home. This has decreased. So we can really see that in the number of books at home. Uh, so we talked about migration. And as you said, uh, new digital uh, mobile phones, you know, computers, they have also decreased the number of uh, time spending uh, with with books. And then I think, Ed, you wanted to... Yeah, I, I'd like to hear what my friend from Tennessee has to say on this too. Massachusetts, by the way, is held by people like me as the model. They got the best schools, the best funding, the best support. People believe in it. But uh, yeah, I, we had a lot of problems in our minority and poorer communities before mm -hmm. this COVID came along. This just adds to it, right. drives the problem deeper down, uh, especially in those communities. I think it will sort itself out in the more financially well-off communities in a year or two without really doing very much. But I'm afraid that the kids that were already behind in terms of attention, in terms of stable teacher core, in terms of stable living environments, those kids uh, were hurt because they were disconnected from what was the only regular duty that they had which was to go physically to a school and follow some rules and learn something they got separated because of covid and they often did not have the capacity to do online learning uh, in terms of the electronics let alone the environment at home so uh, those kids were down and now maybe they're out i'm really concerned about them i don't know how it's going in tennessee but that's my observation here in indiana well when we first um decided to go virtual uh, the every school every student was provided a device and a hotspot. Um, the problem is it still was not enough as far as um, access the access to the internet. Uh, it just wasn't. It wasn't stable enough. It wasn't strong enough. Um, the devices were very helpful, but again, you have children who are in households where you have multiple children trying to learn. Um, you have uh, parents who are working. A lot of the parents in these communities were a part of the. Um, workforce that didn't get to stay home and so you, you know or you have multiple generations living in a house or very small gaps between the generations so you find two or three um i discovered this before the pandemic when we were trying to help a school from being closed you had a bunch of parents who did not have a ged or a high school diploma and they were young and so if you have two or three generations where education has not been a priority and then you're at home. Now, what we did in Tennessee, we had a special session for education 
Um, we approved funding for learning camps where kids were automatically, the teachers were paid a significant amount of money to do it per week. Um, transportation was provided. We're doing that again this year. They have some special interventions they've done during the year. Um, we've gotten our kids back to pre-pandemic levels, but they haven't improved. Um, and that's just based on our standardized testing. And that was last year. Memphis in particular, though, which is 67% African-American, uh, a lot of kids who live in poverty. Uh, we have had some issues on our NAEP testing, really significant issues. Now, I'll be interested to see what happens on the next round because our interventions hadn't been put into effect mm -hmm. when that testing was done. So, so we'll see. Steve Altrino or Jochen, is there anything that you'd like to add before we we bring Stormy into the conversation? Yeah, I, I just want to add something. You know, uh, Steve, you mentioned a myriad of reasons, and all those reasons still exist. Um, you know, we still have um, a great achievement gap, even though Massachusetts continues to try to invest more in education. We we still shamefully have uh, an achievement gap, whether it's because of um, financial or because if it's race, a gender, uh, or would have a location, a zip code. Um, you know, even though we score well in the NAEP, our standardized tests, which we call the MCAS, we're not finding those, those advances. And to live in Massachusetts requires a higher salary, which means we have to attract a better paying jobs. Well, we have a gap in the workforce development. Are they ready? Then we also have a gap on our K-12 teachers. Are they ready to use the new technology that exists? Even myself, when we had to go immediately and when I teach college uh, to an online platform, I'm like, what's the online platform and how do you use it? Right. So you know, we have an AI is very big discussion now. So teachers and school systems have always been behind the eight ball when it comes to using technology. Our students know more than us when it comes to using these devices because they're born with these. Uh, that's going to be an issue whether there's COVID uh, relief or not. So. Thank you. And yeah. I think Jochen Ott, you wanted to add something as well. Yes, I agree most, uh, and uh, I think the main point is we are not focused, as Eleni had said, um, we are not focused. Uh, if they're, if they're in, the, in schools, uh, young pupil without breakfast, without lunch, they cannot learn, they cannot work. If, if we have the problem um, that they are not provided with di digital devices, or the network didn't, didn't work, you know, or is unable to work, um, most of the teacher didn't know how to use it. Um, so if we say we have to, to focus, all the, um, the problems are, are there. And now we have to, to think about how to focus uh, with a, a functional plan uh, to change it. And this is, in our country, um, a little bit uh, um, yeah, problematic because... The, the, the Bundesregierung just said we have, with uh, a program, give money to the federal states. The federal states think about how to get the money to the local authorities. The local authorities transplant it to the schools. And uh, by the way, half of the money is gone. So mm -hmm. um, I know it's a little bit um, uh, uh, joking, but um, there, there is a truth in it. And I think uh, we have to focus on it. It, it, it very that does hat mir sehr gefallen. It was great to say that we have to focus uh, yeah. on some point to change the system. And by the way, uh, the teacher shortage is if if you just come with 18 out of the school and you see all the problems, why the hell you should go to school? Why? Yeah. It's not very attractive. Uh, so we we need a new spirit to say. Become teacher is to make the world a better place, yeah? yeah. But in the moment, they just think, oh no, just uh, look for another job. So, and so far, it bites itself uh, yeah. in the edge. Yeah. So I have a, I have a couple of questions about about teachers that have come in from some viewers. But before I go to those, um, Stormy, you've you've had your hand up for a while. 
Yeah, thank you so much. This is a fascinating debate and we've already touched on so many different aspects. I wanted to pick up on a couple of things which you already said and um, ask um, a, few, a, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, you, um, all of you mentioned the, the challenges of also dealing with or integrating students um, with migration backgrounds, some of them coming from war-torn countries and coming to the country to our countries with a huge trauma. And that trauma um, requires a support system, which is very different from dealing with regular students. And it would require so much more from the teachers. And I'm wondering if we are giving the teachers the necessary support system, how to deal with trauma, because um, dealing with trauma also can induce traumatic effects for those who try to give that support if they don't have the support themselves. And I wanted to ask you if that is somewhere reflected in any kind of legislation, financing programs and assistance um, in, your, in your states. The, the second thing I wanted to pick up on is um, technological change. Um, and um, I, I so agree that usually schools and teachers are far behind the technological changes. And we see it um, with artificial intelligence um, language uh, um, systems and also picture systems like uh, Mid Journey or ChatGPT and so on. So it's really hard to stay on the curve. But what I want, wanted to pick up on is um, a good information and awareness of students and young adults is so pivotal to a liberal society and to um, address the issue of polarization and the threats to democracy. And what I'm driving at is the issue of media literacy. And I'm wondering if we are considering and integrating media literacy enough in, into our curricula um, it has a lot to do how to deal with technology, but it has also a lot to do how to deal with the disinformation environment, so to say. And um, I, um, we had a project um, with U.S. Uh, students, um, uh, high school students and, and German high school students on media literacy and disinformation, and I found it in part shocking, I have to say, um, how little the knowledge really is. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about this. And with this, I take my hand down again. Yeah, who, who <laughs> wants to who wants to tackle those questions first? I'll try. This is it. I'm willing to start. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, yeah. Let's back up a little, a little bit. We're slowly agreeing in our school system and our legislature that mental health is an issue that it ought to be dealt with. That it that the health system ought to be financed for that purpose and that our schools ought to counsel on these issues and have specialists. We're getting there on that side. The next one that we're working on, which is new and I think important, is we've decided that financial literacy is important. We haven't been doing that. So we have so many kids who get into debt either for student loans or buying cars or buying houses they can't afford. So we're, we're adding to our curriculum whole courses on you know how do you manage your money in your life? That's useful. Getting to the next step will be harder, media literacy or dealing with disinformation. We have, understandably, and I'm all for it, I'm a former First Amendment lawyer, we have real issues about how you talk about how you talk or how you talk about what you write. So we will have a big debate at the level of our constitutional, our First Amendment, the right to free speech and so forth about media literacy uh, and disinformation. But I think the young people are prepared to deal with it, uh, to hear about it. And I think you're on to something very important. We need to do that. We don't have local newspapers with local news. Mm -hmm. We don't have anybody, there aren't any filters. So I think that's an important thing, but I gotta say, you're adding one more big burden on us. If you're looking for something useful, you might do, I think, and, and my other Americans might know this, we've dealt with English language learning or second language learning for years there's got to be some place in America where they do it well. I can't tell you where that is. I'm not a pedagogy person. But we've been at it for a long time and putting more money, more effort. Most of our students, if they have a trauma, the foreign language learners are not necessarily refugees, but they may be illegal immigrants, which is sort of a form of refugee. So they do have stress. 
it's not war stress typically. So we, we can probably help on that topic. Uh, if you made a trade, we're all worked up here. And we haven't mentioned this about career and technical education. There's a big push from the right wing to have more people become plumbers and fewer people become uh, doctors of philosophy. Well, we don't know how to do it. We think the Germans and the Swiss know how to do it. I'm not sure if A, they do, or B, it applies to us, but this is something we could trade on both these issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, as financial literacy seems to be the push as opposed to media literacy. Um, I do think that Gen Z and, and younger are going to save us because fortunately they do seem to have some level of savviness, uh, but at the same time, the disinformation and misinformation forces are so strong um and but i, I but again i i i my interns you know the older you get the younger everyone else is and my interns are just brilliant and and i remember being that person and now i'm not so i'm like okay but um i i do think that the mental health aspect um one we have tried but our teachers are so uh one our student to counsel ratio is ridiculous. Um, and then you have states like Texas where they tried to replace, just like last week, tried to replace their counselors with chaplains. Um, and yeah, all right. So I mean, like, you know, we're dealing with that over here in America. Uh, but um, it, it, it's not enough. And, it, and even teachers, like their mental health is not considered. Imagine being a teacher trying to um, teach via Zoom, and then also have your own children trying to learn via Zoom. Like, that's an impossible scenario, and no one's really talked about that That and the level of burnout. I mean, teach the teaching field already had a high level of burnout, and even now. So oh. I don't know if we can get to the point. Um, our system is already overwhelmed, that's what I'll say. But I, I do hope that we can kind of get a little more, what's the word, at least be able to be a little more innovative and meet the needs of what it what our people are going are going to have as issues. Like in Tennessee, we have free community college for all students who graduate from high school or trade school free. Um, if you're 22 and you missed out on that when you were in high school, you can sign up for something called the Reconnect, where you can go and get that sort of education so that you can be prepared for the workforce. So I think we have to take that kind of focus and and make sure that you know you look at Sears 30 years ago. And you look at Amazon now, like where's Sears, where's Amazon? Like, are we preparing our students for the future um, or are we just comfortable with the status quo? If I can just chime in one second on the, on the emotional and social support for teachers is critical. And we have very strong teachers unions in Massachusetts and um, striking is actually illegal in Massachusetts, yet we've had quite a few teachers go on strike. And, you know, besides pay equity, especially for our paraprofessionals and support staff, um, we're also, you know, trying to negotiate uh, stuff for our faculty, whether it's adding more support to students. So we are building health clinics in high schools where we're building um, more support to protect women's reproductive freedoms. Um, we're building teen centers and, and stuff like that because the less stress they face in the classroom as a teacher, the less stress I'll have too And how do you connect with students. Well, but we're also trying to add, uh, lower class sizes, which can be very stressful for uh, teachers. We're trying to add more teacher prep, common planning time. Um, you know, we, we have daycares in some of our high schools. And as the pregnancy rates are lowering in Massachusetts, we're actually offering them to faculty members who don't have to struggle with getting women back in the workforce so that their three-year-old doesn't have to worry about daycare so the teacher can come back to work, et cetera. Um, but all those resources not only help the students, but I think they also help the teachers. Um, when it comes to um, vocational ed, we're expanding vocational ed. Our labor unions are also in the high schools now. They're doing courses to when you get out of high school, you can go right as an apprentice, etc. But that's only as good as us making sure we have jobs that will keep building roads and bridges and, and, and stuff like that. The last thing on the um, 
on the media and stuff. But like Ed says, we don't have local news anymore, and that's a shame. Um, it's also affecting voter turnout because people are so focused on the divisive national news. Uh, but a, as an instructor, even when I was in high school, I focused on proper research, making sure your research is uh, valid, almost like the old, um, when, when you have to do APA, how valid is that research? Is it coming from a media outlet? Is it coming from a journal article that has been professionally reviewed. Um, and we lose that research skill when we use technology more. So I think it starts there. And um, I don't think we're ever going to control what Fox News or CNN or any other media outlet says, but we can at least educate the students on how to find valid research. Yeah. yeah. If you want, I, I can here now start. I agree. First of all, with um, media literacy, um, I think in theory, this is okay. Uh, so in all um, the, the, the rules and texts from governments, there's no problem. But in practice, uh, there's no time um, to talk about. And um, um, there's uh, always the question, um, is it uh, time enough to talk about how important it is to know what uh, the source is coming from, for example. And uh, when he just said uh, that in the US you're losing the local news, I just can say we in the we in progress to lose the local news. Uh, we have a fight against public television and public radio. This is a big problem, I'm afraid of. Uh, um, making the same mistakes uh, the U.S. did before, because then there is no in interest in in the, in the local place to see uh, what is the source, where it's coming from, and uh, how can I make my my opinion myself. Um, second question was like um, was a trauma support of the system. The the main problem, in my opinion, is that. In Germany, we still think we we teach teacher in subjects. Yeah, they they have their history teacher, German teacher, English teacher, but but education in um, historical sense, in in a Greek sense, yeah, like Greek philosophers, Greek teachers, two thousand years over two thousand years ago, or in a humanistic sense, um, this is missing and for example um i, I think that um we have uh to to big bring a focus on the on the question in in a time where artificial intelligence helps us it is the question is it is it really necessary to bring in school content into the brain or is it more sensible to think about uh, creative uh, about arts about music, theology, philosophy, to get um, an idea how to manage with knowledge and how to uh, deal with it in the future. And, and I think this is a really big problem because uh, in Germany we always have that, the discussion of, oh, there is no meritocracy anymore. Yeah? Uh, and I think uh, we have here a big problem because... Um, in, an, in the new world, in the new coming world, um, there is no sense uh, if, if you, uh, uh, perhaps you can uh, give everything for uh, what you learned, you give it uh, again and say, here, I learned it, and you don't know how to manage it. Uh, and and so, therefore, I think we, have, we need a reform of the uh, system in the, in the whole. Uh, and the last point is basic competence, of course, is, is still needed. We talked about before, this is language. And it is quite interesting for the American friends, perhaps, that in Hamburg, in Hamburg in the last 10 years, the results uh, did much better because they focus on more um, German language, read and speak and write, more of mathematics and the basis competences. And it's quite interesting 
are in, in comprehensive to Berlin, that's the state Berlin and the state Bremen, that uh, the state Hamburg did quite well. And so we, for example, go to Hamburg uh, in several days uh, to, to look and to learn because uh, I think it's worth learn from each other. Thank you. Um, Andrea Sturm, do you, do you want to respond? Since we are drawing to an end, I would just like to make a very short remark. Uh, we have lowered the voting age uh, from 18 to 16. So I think it's a major challenge now because we already said, oh, 18, that's maybe after school. So they will have politics in school. But now at the age of 16, this is a real challenge for our curriculum to, uh, yeah, to, to prepare children. Uh, maybe about Hamburg, I would like to say that this is exactly what we are aiming at because not only has Hamburg uh, more German lessons, but they have a language test two years before elementary school. Uh, and if people fail this test, uh, they, have to go to, uh, they have to go to a compulsory language lesson for one year and then to do a test again. And I think this is the right way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so indeed, we are running out of time, but I would like to, to fold two, two viewer questions in that do have to do with teachers. Um, one of our, our viewers comments that, that one of the worst education policies in the U.S. is not paying teachers what they're worth. This is true of police officers and, and teachers as well, that they can't live in the communities that they teach in or that where they are police. And yet the viewer writes, you know, teachers are the key to the future of our children. So why can't we solve this problem? Why can't we address um, this in a, in a more profound way? And another viewer um, says that maybe one of the challenges of the teacher shortage, at least in the U.S., is caused both by the cost of getting an education as a teacher, but also the length of time it takes to get a degree in education or in teaching. Would some kind of apprenticeship model for teachers in both countries be a possible solution by providing quality training over a shorter period of time and allowing people to quote, earn while they learn? I'd love to hear you know, all of your thoughts as, as we wrap up on, on these two questions, sort of how do we, how do we crack the nut of, uh, of finding good teachers? And are there maybe some, some innovative and interesting ways to change the, the training for them. Who would like to, to go first? I'll, I'll uh, oh, go ahead, send it if you want. Oh. Uh, one thing, on, um, you know, it's, it's you know, I agree any public servant, whether it's a person at City Hall, whether it's a police officer, firefighter, teacher, elected official, or what have you, yes, the salaries are much less than the private sector but you pay for those through tax dollars. So when you, when you hear critics of what, you know, teachers need more money, police, fire, uh, you have to talk about the tax structure. You know, where is this money going to come from? Uh, or do you take from one area of government, whether it's spending on healthcare and move it over to public safety or education? So yes, uh, I also think what's missing is, is the teaching profession respected anymore? Mm -hmm. And I am going to say as a pessimist, it's not. You know, as a principal, people would question what my teachers are doing. And I would say, well, when you put in a heating system, did you tell the plumber how to put in the heating system? And that didn't go over very well, but it's true. There's, the respect for teachers has gone down, in my opinion. When it comes to training teachers, you need the most qualified people in the classroom. They need to know pedagogy. They need to know the content area. But what we're doing in Massachusetts is we're also getting our paraprofessionals who are a few credits shy of maybe a bachelor's degree or who have already had the classroom experience. We're, we're offering courses, most of them through scholarships, to get them certified as teachers. That is helping, especially as we're trying to recruit more minority teachers so our students who are of minority persuasion can maybe relate more to a teacher of color or a teacher um, of a different cultural background. So there are ways to do that. Should we shorten the criteria? You know, in my opinion, as a professional educator, no. 
but can we start them off at maybe an apprentice like unions do you go you know from yeah. journeyman to friends whatever um, absolutely but the best way is through teacher support working on while you're in college working as a substitute working as a paraprofessional working as an assistant nurse or a school psychologist and then principals love when they're interning in the schools because they end up hiring them when they finish their credentials. But to lower any type of credential, in my opinion, is doing the students uh, a disjustice. And I'm not talking about passing a teacher's test. I'm talking about knowing the content and knowing how to, um, knowing pedagogy. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh well, I'll say we actually have a program called Grow Your Own. It is the first um, teacher apprenticeship program in the country. And um, President Biden actually gave it a shout out at his State of the Union. Um, so it does have some sort of bipartisan buy-in in that regard. Uh, it allows people who are wanting to enter the teaching field to go to school or receive training while also teaching. So they one, they don't have to pay for the education, and two, they're able to get paid, and so they can continue to sustain a lifestyle. So you're getting people who aren't, you know, fresh out of college or who aren't fresh out of high school who are able to kind of enter that field. Um, another thing that we have, we have um, a minority teacher scholarship trying to promote Black and Brown people to enter the the workforce or the teaching force, and so they can receive a really a full scholarship or at least the second half of their uh, education paid for once it's identified that they want to be a teacher. Uh, the bottom line is, though, teachers are not paid enough, period. Um, it is an issue when you think about it being public dollars. Um, however, you look at our um, our charter schools are more innovative, um, not innovative, flexible um, types of schools where they can get funds from the philanthropic community. They have more control over their budget and they are able to pay their teachers more. Also, when we have interventions, we have a program called the iZone where the teachers teach a little bit longer, the students stay a little bit longer, and they're able to be paid more. So I think um, our school district in Tennessee, in Memphis, has a $1.4 billion budget. Uh, so we might have to look at, you know, your your overhead, whereas and what actually gets to the classroom, all sorts of things are, are really um, concerns. But when you're telling teachers they can't teach from certain books and you're banning books from their classrooms and you're telling them that they don't have to respect the rights of students because they have their own bill of rights so they can misgender a student, when you're um, <clears throat> not providing the support that they need, why would someone want to go into that field, period? Um so I think we have to overcome that. And we have done that a little bit through our state universities, you know, giving incentives again so that you don't graduate from college with this sort of debt, but with the uh, obligation that you would teach in a school system for a period of time. Thank you. Uh, Andreas Sturm, I think you were trying to, to get a word in as well. Yes. Uh, when it comes to salary, I think in Germany, especially in my state, uh, salary is not a problem because... Uh, the teachers in my state are some of the well uh, best paid in the whole of Europe. So the salary is about uh, $60,000 uh, and they don't have to uh, pay pension contribution, but get a very high pension. So I think salary is not the problem. The problem we have is to qualify people who uh, are career jumper. You know, uh, there is this uh, scientist, for example, he wants to teach in school. And this is a real problem we, because we can't make them a uh, uh, tenured um, civil servant. And I think we have to work on that because there are a lot of people who are in chemistry, maybe in physics. They want to work at school. They don't have the school. Uh, they, they, they don't have the education, the proper education to become a tenured civil servant. Uh, so we offer them a job, but we don't pay them as well. And they have, have no chance without teachers training to get a tenured civil servant. And I think this is something we have to work on. Thank, Thank you. you. I would like to uh, add to this. Um, I, I really think, uh, too, that Germany pays um, uh, paid good. But the problem is, uh, older the pupils, the more money, the younger the people, the less money. Uh, this is a problem when you focus on the small to get better um, results. And the second point is, um, Andreas Sturm said it before, the qualify of more career changers or jumpers. 
um, because the bureaucratic system doesn't mm -hmm. allow to get them into the system. And uh, there we have to be a little more open to get them in. And at the end, uh, in Germany, it's not the money, but there's a supporting system, which uh, was uh, just uh, mentioned, the supporting system um, to, to help teachers to get their job done um, by nurses or doctors or uh, family helpers, uh, youth workers. Uh, this The question of how do we settle school in, in a, a sort of a, a little village in uh, um, which all the professions get together to help the youngsters for development. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the exercise uh, we have to, uh, to deal with. Thank you. And the last word goes to you, Ed Delaney. I think the key thing is respect for teachers is lacking and there's reasons. Partly it is that when I was a kid, the teachers were among the very few well-educated people. Now there are many other people who consider themselves equally or better educated than our teachers. That's part of the respect problem. Uh, we accuse them of propagandizing, of trying to turn kids into uh, LGBTQ when they weren't that way. So the accusations have to stop. The pay has to go up. The support has to be there. And uh, that's very, very hard to get done. And I think our young people entering college see these problems. So they say, why do I need to go into that? Uh, we've, we've crushed the role of the unions in this state. So the teachers really don't have the advocate that they used to have. Uh, and the sense of common unity under this structure, that's a problem. So I think we've got a lot of work to do. I hope, I hope we can make some progress. Well, we've we've gone a little over, and I think that that is a, a testament to um, how interesting and and wide ranging our conversation today has been, um, but also a testament to how difficult some of these challenges are that we face both in in Germany and in the United States. It's been interesting for me as a as a, a lay person to to listen to all of you and and really see some areas where they're is commonality, um, but also some areas where I think that maybe we could, you know, learn from each other a little bit. But the bottom line is how do we make a good education accessible to everybody and how do we create opportunities? Um, and I, I think one of the, the biggest challenges that we face in both of our societies is how do we train young people today for the jobs that will exist the day after tomorrow? And that in some cases we can't even imagine right now because of the technological issues that that Stormy was talking about. So I feel like we're we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg in our conversation today and and obviously we've talked about a lot of things already but we've we've also left a lot of questions unanswered. Um I'm certainly walking away from this with lots of food for thought and I want to thank all all five of you for really taking the time to speak with us today. I've found it an incredibly informative and and fascinating exchange. I also want to thank you, Stormy, and, and the team at Aspen, you and your colleagues, but also my colleagues here at the American Council on Germany for collaborating yet again. And, and I look forward to more opportunities to work together in the future. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, it's always great to have a good audience with, with lots of good questions. So let me just uh, say herzlichen Dank. Many thanks to, to everybody today. Um, I, I wish the, the American viewers a, a good rest of the day, a good afternoon, um, and a good evening to, to our friends in Germany. Yeah, and also many, many thanks from my side. Um, as always, it's been a pleasure cooperating uh, with you and your team, Steve, and many, many thanks to our um, excellent uh, panelists. And I took, as Steve said, I, I also took away so much food for thought. Um, I have several pages of ideas written down where we have to do follow up and uh, what we could do um, in transatlantic learning. And I want to thank you really very, very much um, for initiating this. And I hope we'll see each other again soon and pick it up here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.